And then uh, I just saw this thing and was like, Chris, uh, like, what was that? <laughs> and he looked over and there's, there's literally this bear on its hind legs staring at us probably about 100, 150 meters away. And we're just like, oh my God. Hey folks, this episode's going way back to 2015 when Kurt was still the host. Kurt and Travis were hosting, and uh, this is a Throwback Thursday episode uh, to an episode talking about cycling the entire length of the Americas, something I've always wanted to do. I've done close to half of that, but I have not done the South America or Central America portion. Would love to, love, love to do that sounds incredible um and and there's some good stories in here as you can tell from the uh, from the intro so and also before we get started i did want to mention uh some of the folks making this show happen specifically the restoration depot uh, i know you've heard them in the, over the last few weeks but basically uh, if you don't know about the restoration depot you can obviously find out more at the restoration depot.com and what they do is uh, you know, just bringing more fun to your life through online engaging classes like yoga classes, Tai Chi, essential oil classes, music classes. It, it's all these classes that you can have in a virtual setting if you're working from home or if you're traveling. On your first class, you can try for $5 by selecting the first class special at checkout. And they just launched a whole new series of classes, different workout classes and just different different disciplines and different uh different things to live a healthy life and they make it fun and make it make it really um really enjoyable to be a part of so if you're ready to have fun to live well and to join a community check out the restoration depot.com they are helping make this show happen so we want to just really say thank you to them and uh, encourage you to check it out but anyway here's the episode with kurt and danny Hello and welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. This is your host, Kurt Linville. Boy, do we have an exciting show for you today. Two gentlemen, Chris Lally and Danny Beach, started last July in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, and rode their bikes all the way to the southernmost city of the Americas, to Ushuaia, Argentina, and they were attempting a world record. I have Danny here today to tell us all about this attempt, and uh, both these guys grew up in the UK, north of, of London, and they attended St. Andrews together where they became friends, and they recently started biking, and it led to this epic adventure. So, Danny, welcome to the program. Hi there, Kat. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited, Danny, to talk to you about all this. What a fun trip. I mean, it's kind of yeah. crazy because the way you just described it to me, you guys met at the university and you started biking just recently, and then all of a sudden it was, well, let's just do the Pan American Highway. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it was all of a sudden. Like we'd, uh, <laughs> we'd, uh, yeah, we had uh, already biked from the north of France to Rome, and we'd done like the length of the UK. Um, but obviously, with these things, you always you want to do bigger, you want to go further. And um, when the opportunity was available to um, for us to get the scholarship to do this, we realized we could go big. Why not try and cycle the length of the world, basically, the, no, the length of both continents? Well, tell us about the scholarship and how this idea was planted. Yeah, we're in our last year of university, and I think I'm I'm a medical student, so I was uh, I'm halfway through my degree, and Chris was in his last year of his his course, and uh, we figured like life's life's going a bit too fast, you know, maybe we should uh, we should take a year out and do something crazy, do an adventure. I don't know, but we were throwing all sorts of ideas out there, you know, trying to cycle around the world, or I wanted to some stupid things like mountain bike along the seven greatest rivers of the seven continents or something some ridiculous things like this um and then uh we just just staring at google maps basically and thinking like what's the best thing we could possibly do what's the most exciting adventure we could possibly go on through the most countries give ourselves the most incredible experience possible and the pan american highway seemed like a great idea also because there is already a world record for that that we thought we could break and it was uh, to average about 112 miles a day for 125 days over 14 and a half thousand miles and we thought we could have a real go at this. And so we presented the idea to uh, a panel at the university who give out this 
the scholarship to any student with an exciting, innovative idea. Um, and me and Chris were the first people ever to apply as a, as a duo. Um, and we said we can break the world record for doing the Pan American Highway. Um, and we'd like you to give us money to attempt this ridiculous idea. And amazingly, they said, you know, um, in conjunction with another scholarship from a, um, a family, the Alex Richardson family, um, they also gave us some money towards it. Um, and, you know, this, this idea just started to become very, very real. And we were on the, soon on the plane to Alaska. <laughs> it's crazy, really. Well, that's, that is a fun story. Fantastic. So yeah. how much planning did it take? To uh, I mean, you had to have the right kind of bikes, the right kind of gear, all that kind of stuff. How how long did it take you guys to prepare for this attempt? Well, we saw at the end of July. We probably really we knew we were going to be able to do it at the beginning of yeah, end of March kind of time. So like about about a year ago. Um, so yeah, we're looking at like four four months of sort of just seriously looking into that route, almost living it as we, much as we possibly could on. Google Street View as much as we could. We found out which bits are gravel, which bits are proper road, where the biggest altitude's going to be, which cities we should try and avoid, which places, you know, what's the best way to go from the US into Mexico? Can we even go to these countries like El Salvador, Honduras? Is it safe to cycle there? Colombia? My dad's, my dad was absolutely terrified. My mum was worse, but my dad was saying, <laughs> he's saying, you know, you need a police army escort through Colombia because it's the drugs and it's absolutely terrible at the moment and things. And, um, Obviously, yeah, that was just one side of it. Obviously, the bike and everything, we had to learn a lot more about the mechanics of the bike and everything that could possibly go wrong, just that sort of stuff. Um, and the physical training, giving up every every bit of beer, every cake, <laughs> just, trying to, <laughs> just trying to get very, very focused on this, on this mission. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so tell us the kind of bikes that you selected to use for this. Well, we'd spoken to Mark Beaumont, who uh, he's the Scottish... Endurance cyclist, he holds the record for cycling the length of Africa currently. Um, he's done this, a lot of this sort of thing before. And he'd cycled the route from Anchorage to Oswaya before. Um, so we just asked him for some advice. Um, and we decided to go with, um, steel, steel frames, touring bikes, just indestructible, durable beasts, basically. Um, and then we had, we had panniers on the back and front. Um, and yeah, our, our, our idea was that there's going to be a lot of, potholes a lot of gravel um we just don't want to be we don't want to be having the bikes let us down um if we fail this we want it to be for you know for some other reason like the, the bikes just have to be perfect so we uh we decided to go down that route because like mark Beaumont had said he cycled africa on a on a carbon fiber kind of style bike um but we figured um that we could we feel we figured we could make this mileage on the steel frame um, and we were, yeah, we were extremely close in the end, but I'll tell you about that later, I guess. <laughs> okay. So you selected a heavier, more durable bike and, you know, for distance touring, that's probably a pretty good selection, but when you're trying to set a world record, how much do you think that may have slowed you down? Yeah, I think there were, obviously when the wind's kicking in your face and, uh, <laughs> you're crawling up some, you know, 20, 30% hill in Colombia, you're thinking, I wish I had a slightly, slightly faster bike and maybe a bit less weight on the back. <laughs> Um, but we did have to carry a lot of food as well at times, especially going up to the north of Alaska. It was, you know, two, 200 miles to the next cafe, probably about 400 miles to the next stop where we'd be able to pick up supplies. So that's, that's two or three days of, you know, food. And when you're e eating seven, eight, nine thousand calories a day, actually, that's a lot of food. That's carrying 30, 30,000 calories of food. Um, so we needed to, a bike that could carry this weight and that was going to be reliable. Um, and obviously the road conditions as well. Um, we needed something that was going to be able to take take the abuse. And fourteen and a half thousand miles is a hell of a long way. Um, and we, we couldn't even believe these steel frame bikes could make that. But um, we definitely <laughs> fell, fell, fell in love with my little steel frame bike. <laughs> oh, I bet you, they become a part of you after a little while, don't they? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> What did it feel like when you got to Prudhoe Bay and uh, you got your bikes together and everything's ready to go and you look at each other and say, wow, we're actually going to do this now? What, what was that feeling like? Yeah, I, it's just ridiculous to describe, really. We'd had, we'd had quite a, it's quite a funny story, actually. We'd had a few days before um, on our way from the UK to America, um, we discovered in Germany that uh, we didn't actually have the, well, the correct visa for America. <laughs> because we hadn't we hadn't booked a flight out and in germany they said you don't have a flight out of america so we're not gonna we're not gonna let you get on this plane 
Um, so we were just thinking, we've planned this trip and told everyone we're going to cycle into the Pan American Highway and we're not even going to get into the US. This is a complete and total embarrassment. Um, <laughs> um, so we booked a flight from uh, Fort Lauderdale in Florida to Jamaica just um, just to prove that we had a flight out of the USA. <laughs> just to have a visa. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, 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 just so... We were sitting on this flight to Alaska, just just sweating, panicking, looking at each other, going over and just thinking, like, we actually can even be allowed into the U.S. after all this. Um, but thankfully, we were. Um, and we got on the flight to Prudhoe Bay. Everything seems fine. Um, and you just land at this place. This I, I've never been anywhere like it. It was flat for as far as you can possibly see, just gravel and dust everywhere. Um, and it's just the oil field, the airport, and two... Like two little lodges, um, yeah, basically nothing. And just just the guy in the airport, um, and everyone's up there to work with oil. Um, we didn't meet any other adventurers actually in Prudhoe Bay. Um, yeah, and then I'd actually had my bear spray bear spray confiscated um, by U.S. Customs going up there, which is completely ridiculous because <laughs> you, know, you know you're out there with no shops, nowhere to get any defense from these bears. Um, so we landed in Prudhoe Bay, and literally the first thing the woman said to us there was. There's nine bears in town, boys. Be careful. Uh, wow. And we were just like, we were panicking because it was, it was quite, we had 24 hours of daylight and it was about eight in the evening. And we were just thinking, do we, do we stop for the night here when we think we're going to be a bit safer or do we just, just get on with the cycling and just go for it? Um, we decided to just go for it. But, um, yeah, I guess my initial feeling being on the road was, you know, we did the little, we took a video of, um, right. This is Danny Beach, Chris Lally. Starting out on a 14,000 mile quest to the bottom of Argentina. Um, it's 1738 on the 28th of July. Here we go. <laughs> and we just set off and like the rush was just incredible. Just four months of planning for this trip. And suddenly we're just, we're just side by side on this gravel track. Just, just us and the bikes. The bikes had made it. We hadn't got injured. We had all our supplies and we were just riding out south. And there was only one, only one road. We're riding south. Just like finally this is happening. <laughs> Absolutely just. And phenomenal feeling of just, just the most, yeah, incredible, probably the most incredible feeling, apart from actually finishing, the most incredible feeling of the whole trip was that beginning when it all became really, really real. Um, yeah, unfortunately, about, <laughs> about a few minutes later, we realized that we were out here alone with the bears and <laughs> we were going to have to sleep with them that night. <laughs> um, so, were they uh, polar bears or, or grizzlies or what are we talking about? Uh, these are grizzlies. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a lot of bears in Alaska. We, we, we just, we didn't want to stop because we were looking, we, we kept hearing little noises and rustlings and, cause it was just, there was nowhere, no one else on the road, just us. And we actually cycled till two o'clock in the morning, um, just cause we were scared and didn't want to camp, basically. <laughs> but we well, realized we, we had all this food and we're like, if the bears want the food, then we're, we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, you had just flown in, too, so I know you had to be exhausted. How, you probably had been up for 36 hours. Yeah, we, we stopped in Anchorage Anchorage for a day, um, so that sort oh, of okay, made good. Recover, recover a little bit, but yeah, we were pretty disorientated still. Yeah, and we got it got to about 2 in the morning, and we were like, right, that's, that's it, I'm not cycling through the night, this is ridiculous. Um, so we pitched up camp just by the side of the road, just, well, just, just like put the bikes by the side of the road. And then, uh, I just saw this thing and was like, Chris, uh, like, what was that? <laughs> and he looked over and there's, there's literally this bear on its hind legs, <laughs> just like staring at us probably about 100, 150 meters away. Oh no. Uh, and we're just like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. <laughs> we just, <laughs> just, we just jumped on the bikes and, I don't know. There's that. There's that famous picture. It's always circulating around Facebook of um, a guy being chased or chased by a bear on his bikes, and it kind of it kind of felt a bit like that. Because <laughs> I don't know, maybe not quite as close as that that picture, but this bear was coming for us, and we were absolutely panicking, just sprinting off. Um, yeah, and then eventually um, we found like a little metal enclosure where we could um, put the food in, and we felt a little bit safer. Um, Chris actually managed to squeeze himself through the hole into this metal enclosure. <laughs> so he felt, he felt entirely safe, but um, I don't know. My, my back, my back's a bit funny, so I, I, I wouldn't get, I couldn't get through this little gap that he got through, and he was, he was almost trying to like squish me through this gap so we could be safe, and we were both panicking. Um, <laughs> eventually, eventually, we just got. It was a ridiculous evening. Uh, we, eventually, we were just both so tired, we just, we just had to camp. Um, and then, yeah, the next day we sort of started for real and um, started putting in the big miles. 
which is good. <laughs> so did you have a lot of bear encounters then, or is that is that just the kickoff of the trip? Uh, no, there were a few, yeah. I mean, there's a few really dense areas as we started to get into into northern Canada and you know, Yukon and stuff. We think we saw seven bears. I think two of them were grizzly, five blacks. Uh, a couple of times they walked across in, in front of them in the road, um, which was pretty scary, really. There was one time they went in, but I was just behind Chris by a few meters, and they went out, and a black bear came out in front of us, in, uh, behind Chris, sorry, in front of me. Um, and it just stood there, and we just sort of stared, stared at each other for a while. <laughs> he was just standing on the road, just thinking, is this, I don't know, <laughs> you're not really sure what's going to happen next. But <laughs> thankfully, he sort, of, he sort of scuttled out into the bushes, and we were okay. Um, but the, the wildlife in wildlife in North America was just just ridiculous, and I think being on a bike just gave us that. The, got, it allowed us to get so close to the to the nature. And there was one day in British Columbia, we were we were herding bison. There's just tons of bison all over the road, and we were just they, they didn't like the bikes, so we were just sort of shuffling along the road like them along the road for quite a, a fair portion of the day. Um, I got a puncture actually, and we were just both totally fixed focused on fixing this puncture. And uh, we just heard a car tooting, turned around, and there was a bison about just four or five meters away, just curiously coming over to see what we were doing. And <laughs> I don't know, we, I'd never seen a bison before. These things are like half bear, half cow. Like, <laughs> <laughs> They're bison. huge. Yeah, when they walk, the whole the whole world shakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite a, quite an experience. Um, but I don't know, it was kind of amazing too, I guess. <laughs> well, that's fun. Holy cow, what an adventure! So you said that. Um, to beat the world record, you had to do more than 112 miles a day. Is that right? Uh, yep. It was, yeah, 125 days in total, averaging about, uh, yeah, 112 miles per day. So those are not light days. If you're going to average that much, then you must have put in some really long days along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, especially since the average is including that um, you have to uh, fly the small portion from Panama City to Cartagena in Colombia because uh, there's no road from Colombia to Panama. Um, and also just, I guess, fixing the bike a few times and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite a heavy mileage. Um, I think, you know, we put in some very, very big days, especially down in, in South America. We hit our biggest day was 172 miles. Um, just a bit of a beast, especially when you're doing it back to back. Um, yeah. And things like just big things slow you down, like the gravel tracks up north and stuff. Um, yeah, I think as soon as we landed in Alaska, we knew it was going to be a lot. A lot more difficult than we'd anticipated with you, how slow gravel was. Because, I mean, it's the thing about the UK, everywhere you go, there's a paved road, almost no matter if it's the big red road, the small white road on the map, like it's, they're all paved and cyclable. But <laughs> up in Alaska, you know, down in Argentina as well, just the gravel made it things very, very difficult, very, very long days cycling it. You know, we we're cycling seven in the morning till 10, 11 at night or something, just with very few breaks at times. So, yeah. Wow, it's that's tough. that's quite a feat. Pretty exhausting, and you're doing it day after day after day after day after day. Yeah, I mean, I can yeah, honestly say of the full 130 days that it took us, we um, the only times we stopped were when sickness prevented us. Just you know, horrible sickness that I don't know if you want me to describe on your program. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, basically cycling yeah just became impossible on the on the only days that we stopped. Um, and apart from that, we were just going pretty much hell for leather all the time as fast as we possibly could. Well, tell me a story of one of your favorite days on this trip when it was just an amazing experience. Uh, that's another, some difficult ones. It's went to, <laughs> with some dangerous days, some <laughs> dangerous days that turned out okay and stuff like that. But I think we would both tell you, both Chris and I would tell you that Colombia was our favorite place to be, our favorite place to cycle. And there was one day where we, we, we looked at the head of the map and we'd seen that this road is um, incredibly wiggly, like... Just you knew there was going to be a climb from absolute hell, <laughs> and we knew we were going to have to reach appro- approximately four thousand meters um, from sea level, um, which is just yeah quite a ridiculous distance to go up on a bike. Um, and yeah, we sort of reached the bottom of this climb, and um, yeah, I'm going to honestly say we sat there for about seven or eight hours just just crawling up a mountain. <laughs> it was a narrow, dodgy road, and lorries flying past us, and we're just we're just crawling up this mountain with. Colombia is incredible because it's it's the Andes, but instead of it's, it's, it's like it's wet, it's green, it's the mountains are ridiculous. This mist that sort of sits in the valleys, um, and the roads you just can't even you can't even imagine how a road can get up the side of that. It's, I mean, my bike had three rings, the lowest gears you can possibly think of, and I was like, I'm never ever going to have to use this lowest gear. 
And then these bits in Colombia where the roads just almost disappeared and you're just going about, must be 30, 30%, just like ridiculous gradients straight up. Um, yeah, and we, we cycled late into the night and we were trying to reach a village um, and it started to get misty and cloudy and we were going so, so slowly, but it was yeah just, just incredible. Um, and then we sort of, we just stopped at this cafe and just said, okay, it's too dangerous to go on. It's been a ridiculous day. We've climbed almost all day of cycling uphill um, and we still haven't reached the, reached the top. Um, so, yeah, and then we just, we unfortunately for the people in this cafe, we, we just said, we're going to sleep here today. Sorry. <laughs> um, and we just, we camped with the Colombian military, which I thought I'd never ever be able to say. Um, just these guys just uh, had a couple of machine guns and just said, um, protection, protection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah, we just sort of lay down in the cafe and slept. Just incredible. And then to wake up the next morning and finish the, the, the mist had cleared and we just woke up the next morning and completed the journey into the mountains. And we could look back. There was this point where we just did a little happen and we could look back and you could, you could see for maybe like 50 miles or I don't know how far it was, but you could see the different layers of the mountains all the way down to the bottom. Probably just the most incredible view I've, I've ever seen. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that was probably the best experience for me. Just, just how the, the views in Colombia were just completely breathtaking. You know, what a rewarding experience to amazing. You know, I don't think anyone could do a feat like this and remain exactly the same person. Um, how did this impact your life? How did it change you? We both changed. We both just want, <laughs> obviously, we just want to do it again, which is the main the main problem now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you're hooked on it. Yeah, no, it's a completely addictive, addictive lifestyle. I just, um, I loved how it's so, it's so in the moment. There's no... There's no worries about the future or like, am I going to get a job? Like, am I going to, you know, do this course, have to pay for this? Like, I don't know. There's no worry about anything else apart from being in the moment. I, am I going to get knocked off my bike? How can I protect myself as best as possible in this moment? Um, and maybe in the back of your mind is like, are we going to find somewhere to sleep tonight? And it was just, it was four months of just being totally just, I don't know. Yeah, you know, we're just, just us two, um, just dealing with the problems that came your way. And we were just totally on a mission. And, um, yeah, I just really want to get that, that buzz back of just solely being focused on one thing and achieving one thing. And like, we'd, we'd almost whisper the word Oswaya, which was the, the southernmost city. And we'd, I'd go, Chris, <laughs> we're getting closer. Or Oswaya. <laughs> and then we'd both just be like, Oh, don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> we don't want it to end this soon. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, even though it was pretty painful, like the saddle soles were completely horrendous on the way and stuff. But, um, we knew that as, as soon as we got towards the end, it was going to, we were just going to wish we were back out there. Um, yeah. So I think this is, it's just changed me as in, I want to be more adventurous with, um, with my life. And, um, if I can find a way, try and find a way to do that through yeah, my, my medical studies or through, um, another adventure or, or something like that, then, uh, I most certainly will because it is very addictive and, an inc- incredible thing to have had the opportunity to do. Do you have any recommendations for people, um, tips or tricks, if someone else wanted to do a long distance ride like this? I think the trick is to be mentally determined and to not let anyone stand in your way. And if you want to do it, then just go for it. And yeah, d- don't be don't don't be scared of um, going to these countries and don't don't be put off before you before you go because the people love cyclists. The people love to hear that you're on a mission. Like the countries that. We were most scared of like Mexico, Colombia, El Salvador, Honduras. These sorts of countries were where the people were most welcoming, um, and um, yeah, they they loved us, which was a fantastic thing for us. Um, but obviously, you need them just the determination in the first place to just believe that you can you can make it. Um, and yeah, once you get that in your head, there's there's nothing stopping you really. Um, yeah, and just take the right tires. <laughs> make sure you've got got a bike that that's going to uh, be reliable and uh, put the training hours in and um, yeah you can you can cycle you can cycle anyway you, I don't know running <laughs> whichever go for it go for it I I think there's a real key point there and that is if we if we take the time to say what if and start worrying about all of the the potential things that may or may not ever happen right mm-hmm. then we may never get out of the the front door yeah. but if instead of saying what if we say let's just let's just do let's go Mm -hmm. right and get started then uh, a lot of things just work out yeah exactly i mean yeah if you speak to you know some of my friends or family they'll tell you the amount of hours i put into preparing for this things i mean i've never never 
focused like that um, ever. Um, just trying to make sure that I knew exactly where we were going each, almost each day to the point where I had a day-to-day -day plan before we went. Um, but then looking back, I'm just thinking, how much did we actually stick to the plan? How much was my preparation even useful? Like we were just, we weren't making it up as we were going along, but there's a lot of, a lot of things that just sort of, you can't prepare for. You don't really know what's going to happen to you on that day. Like advice that you'll just pick up along the way as you're going, you'll, you'll meet other tall cyclists. They'll tell you about certain things. You'll just speak to people in the, in the rest, in the restaurants or the shops or whatever. And they'll, you know, they'll, they'll guide you the best the best routes and especially with crossing the borders through central america and stuff we were just we were we were absolutely terrified like you can you can plan for crossing the border from the, the u.s into mexico um yeah which was quite an interesting place for us because we'd, we'd already cycled about 40 days in the english-speaking world and suddenly two non-spanish speakers are going to just cycling across the land border into mexico um after spending about 10 days in texas with Every single person telling us that Mexico is the most dangerous place in the world and <laughs> all this bad things about Mexican people and stuff. And, um, you know, we were kind of worried. <laughs> um, yeah, that Mexican border actually, we, um, we, we just went across, um, because the, the border to get into the US is obviously the crossing. The amount of people trying to get into the US was much, much bigger than the amount of people going into Mexico. So you just sort of, you're just like, woo, I'm in Mexico. <laughs> and suddenly, <laughs> just like that. Suddenly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just, you're kind of terrified going through this little town and then suddenly you just you're just there and everybody's screaming everything's a bit more nuts the drivers are trying to knock you off and uh it's just great music everywhere um and we sort of missed the the border station went to a checkpoint about 20 or 30 miles out of the across the border and they said to us um you haven't got the right paperwork from the border you have to go back oh no we literally we spent a whole two days before just hearing stories of that border is the most dangerous place. Obviously, with all the drug problems, um, even the the Mexican guys in Texas were telling us like, as soon as you cross that border, cycle a hundred miles, get to Monterey, get to the first city, um, and you'll be okay. Set off at first light and don't stop cycling until dusk. And we'd cycled thirty miles and had to go back into this place that they said that was the most dangerous place on earth. <laughs> uh, like, honestly, it felt like a level of Call of Duty, like. <laughs> everything's just a bit deserted a lot of guys wearing balaclavas and machine guns and we're just two british guys just looking pretty dirty and just cycling along it's like i don't know just kind of hoping everything's gonna be all right um and then yeah but thankfully we, did, we didn't make it to monterey that day but um i think we cycled about 130 miles and got got pretty close um yeah and then thankfully we we had a lot of contacts that we met through the university to meet along the way um so, oh, this was actually my, uh, one of my, uh, granddad's friends who lived in Mexico welcomed us on that second day in Mexico and made us feel a bit more secure about, uh, Central America. Mexico was actually one of the most incredible places we visited in the end. I think that it really is true that there are dangerous places no matter where you are on the planet, but, you know, you can keep your nose clean, <laughs> stay with the, the right kind of areas and the right kind of crowds, and, and it, it really is pretty safe. And most of Mexico is, is very safe, but I, I understand the border towns can be a little sketchy. Yeah, we were just obviously just trying to stay out of trouble. And I think we're, we're not taking, we weren't taking anything away from the people there. At the end of the day, if you're a tall cyclist, you, you just, you're just passing by, you're tired, you're hungry, probably you just, you're just cycling. Like, um, and if anything, you, you know, you're talking to the people about your lives and asking them about theirs and people just seem to love, love someone that's just doing something like this. So, um, yeah, we found the people to be exceptionally welcoming. Oh, that's um, yeah. nice. Yeah. Well, tell us about the time that things didn't go right. There had to be a day when things just didn't go as planned. Well, yeah, quite a few, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I think things have gone actually really well all the way down from Prudho to about like Banff, Banff, Jasper sort of area. Um, and we were, we were thinking like we're five days ahead of record pace. We're absolutely flying here. <laughs> Nothing's stopping us. Um, and then unfortunately, Chris started to get really, really ill. Um, just uh incredible like stomach problems and yeah just like just diarrhea basically um and it was just like uns we couldn't con like couldn't find a way to stop it we couldn't we didn't know if it was the water he he was just he'd been drinking bottled water for like a week before and we were like it can't possibly be the water um his diet had been pretty pretty terrible cuz our policy for eating was just like as much as possible all of the time um which turned out to be a terrible idea um <laughs> just <laughs> so many donuts just Tim Horton stops every, you know, three times a day in Tim Hortons. Um, but, um, yeah, and he started to, 
be incredibly unwell. And we cleaned up his diet. I was, I was got to the point of writing down exactly what his exact intake and stuff. <laughs> we were ringing home trying to get like medical advice and stuff because there's no, there's no way we could possibly continue in, in that state, unfortunately. We'd sort of maybe naively or arrogantly beforehand just said, if we get ill, we're going to just carry on. Like kind of um, just the attitude of no matter what hits us, we're just going to keep plowing on. We're tough. We're, we're strong. Like we'll, we'll just keep cycling. Um, and yeah, even if it means we're like, you know, having diarrhea, sickness, whatever on the bike, we'll just keep going. Um, but in reality, uh, this sort of cycle of illness means that you can't eat properly and, um, you know, you're dehydrated and hungry. And when you're on a, a busy, dangerous roads and stuff like this, and you know, you just, it's just incredibly dangerous to keep going when you're that ill. Never mind the, the fact it's incredibly unpleasant. Um, so this, this went on for probably about, um, a week, 10 days, which is just awful. And we would, just, I was incredibly frustrated and probably, I don't know, maybe say just taking it out on Chris. Cause I just, I don't know. I just, I felt I was well and I was, I was just frustrated. He couldn't get better and we were losing time on the record. And Chris was frustrated cause he felt like he was letting me down. And I guess we got a bit tense between us. Obviously we're spending 24 hours a day together basically. Um, and then, yeah, eventually it just, it was just like, let's forget the records. Let's just get well. And, um, then, like we, we kind of just put it in our heads that at the end of the day if two of us can cycle fourteen and a half thousand miles um and make it to the very end that's the most important thing because that's that would be an incredible feat um so we just we focused on that and chris went to hospital and um and eventually it was beaver fever which is uh from bad water mm. uh, Gia- giardia infection and we just drank some water a couple of weeks ago in the some from some rivers in alaska and uh yeah hadn't sterilized it basically which is pretty stupid but um <laughs> yeah this is it's like a it's sat latent for two weeks and then the infection sort of started to manifest itself um yeah so that was a terrible time but he got better and we were back on the road thankfully yeah giardia is not a small thing to recover from either i can't imagine getting back on the bike after that and being strong you know that had to be tough yeah chris did exceptionally well like he, um you know he was, he was losing losing weight and stuff and um really just yeah, he was just, yeah, incredibly struggling really, um, at the start. But, you know, we, we, we've been in great fitness before this and we're exceptionally determined. And you soon get your fitness back when you're just putting in the miles like that. Um, your body just keeps going 100, 100 miles a day. Um, yeah, it soon became just no problem again. And I think just, just the excitement of being, being back again, you know, producing solids stuff, um, <laughs> just, just kind of, uh, propelled us to, um, just keep cycling and keep enjoying it because the, the US was fantastic through Montana, Wyoming, Colorado. Um, loved it. So you went through Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and then you cut into Texas and then uh, down to Mexico from there. Yeah, I skipped a, through a little bit of Oklahoma and then basically down the full length of Texas into uh, Laredo and then, yeah, into Mexico there. So, yeah, quite a journey. But I mean, yeah, the main time we stopped was in Wyoming, kind of in Wild Wild West territory, which is it was good fun. It was nice to, although Chris was obviously pretty ill, it was a fun place to stop just to hear some country music and met some really interesting people, which was nice. <laughs> <laughs> How fun. What a beautiful thing. So you said it took 125 days, is that right? Uh, the record was 125 days and we arrived there uh, in 130. Oh, so close. Yeah, close. Um, I don't know. We, we, saw, we knew from quite a, a long way off that we weren't going to make it, I guess. Um, it was quite weird because, like I say, once once Chris got ill and we'd stopped, we sort of stopped thinking about the record, and we just we started to we were still putting in huge miles, but we were just starting to enjoy it. And and then we figured Mexico to through Central America, like how are we, realistically how are we going to be able to go fast through there and stuff? And we were like, um, let's just survive until Ecuador, until we've crossed the Andes in Colombia. Basically, um, we were just like, let's let's just try and do as much as we can, but we'll just try and stay on the bike and survive. And then maybe once we get if we're still close to the record once we get into Peru, then maybe we'll just go for it. Um, and actually, funnily enough, when we got to Peru, we were we needed to average about 130 miles a day to make the record, and we were we were still thinking like we've got the legs here, we can we can do this. Um, and we started cycling, cycling into the night every single day, maybe two or three hours into the night, um, just pushing ourselves as hard as we possibly could to get those miles in, and we we were hitting them. There were some horrible winds coming off the Pacific down there in Peru, but um, Probably for about a week, two weeks, we were, the record was back on. We'd, we'd crossed the Andes. We were feeling amazing and just flying. Um, and then unfortunately illness struck me down basically. Um, 
I got I got stung in the eye by a wasp. Oh, I don't even know if it was. It was a wasp, just something in the desert, basically. We cycled 166 miles that day, and probably in about the last 10 minutes of the day, I got hit in the eye by something. It's sort of just above the eye, and I was like, oh, thank God that didn't get me in the eye. But um, yeah, I just woke up the next morning with my face all massively swollen and couldn't see out of my right eye, and my left eye was not, I wouldn't say it was 100% vision. Um, and yeah, I've never really had that sort of problem on the bike before, but you lose all depth of perception. So I couldn't, I couldn't tell how far in front of me Chris was or where, exactly where the corners were and stuff. And with the, cause Peru, Peru was just complete desert the whole way. The sand's blowing across the road and stuff. And I was starting to worry that this was getting, the swelling was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we decided to, to get me to hospital, get me some treatment. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately a couple of days there to, you know, get my face back to normal. I looked, looked like an absolute monster for a couple of days. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, it's quite yeah, it's some quite good pictures actually. <laughs> um, a few of my friends were quite worried, but I don't, I don't know if it was really that bad. It was just one of those amazing pictures where you, your face just looks so ridiculous. Um, everyone <laughs> got quite concerned, um, but yeah, they, they just pumped me full of <laughs> like corticosteroids. Basically, I don't. It was the dodgiest hospital in the world, especially for a medical student who's obsessed with all <laughs> and cleanliness, hygiene, wash your hands at every opportunity. This you couldn't even wash your hands in this hospital. I, I asked for soap and they didn't have any. There was dogs and cats running about and a big ant's nest under my bed. <laughs> like I was really concerned about what exactly they were doing to me. But <laughs> The swelling went down and you got to leave. <laughs> That's the end of that. Huh? Yeah, I was thinking I'm in this place, you know, I'm, I'm going to be getting more ill just being here than, uh, <laughs> than I would elsewhere. But yeah, the swelling went down and we were, we were back on the road. Um, but yeah, that sort of killed off that our second win for the world record, which is a shame. Yeah, we did actually cycle the length of South America in 53 and a half days. Um, and the current world record's 58 days. So we, yeah, we're, we're actually speaking to Guinness at the moment to see if we can uh, verify the world record for the length of South America because we were four and a half days ahead of it, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it is. So the Pan American mm. highway record, not so much, but the South American crossing, you could, you could get that one. Yeah. Well, we're hopeful. I mean, we've done it and we've got we've got the gps and stuff and kept the diaries and stuff like that so hopefully hopefully we'll be able to to prove it because yeah south america was a hell of a journey we you know we were thinking once we got to panama we've done most of this if you look on the map you kind of think <laughs> like north america is colossal and we've crossed central america you're just thinking everyone's just saying oh you're almost there now you just doubled down the coast of south america and you're there but um yeah it was it was a long way uh, maybe I don't know, six six and a half thousand miles from Cartagena, Colombia, all the way down to Oswaya. Wow. You know, I have not looked into this, but you probably have. Is the Pan American Highway the longest continuous road north to south in the planet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, well, obviously, about, apart from this gap in, um, in Colombia. Right. Um, there's sort of this, this thing where the, the Colombians want to build a road. And I think um, yeah, quite a few nations would like a road to exist the whole way down from south to Central America. Um, and I think um, Colombia has offered to pay for the road to be built through the jungle, this Darien Gap. Um, but Panama just sees it as a nice natural barrier um, away from the drugs and the cartels and uh, the, the problems that Colombia have. So Panama is totally against building any sort of road through the jungle, um, which I guess is a shame for the point of view of the, you know, it feels like you're cheating a bit to have to, to get the plane from the, you know, Panama City to Colombia. Um but um, I guess it was a good recovery point for us so we could start the second part of the trip. Um, yeah, so yeah, the answer to your question is yes. I believe it is the, the longest single road north to south in the world. And it does really feel like that, like the most northern point, the most northern road in Alaska to the most southern city in the world. Um, and if you look on the map, like Oswaya is considerably further south than New Zealand and it's it's the closest point to Antarctica. Everyone's getting the trips down to Antarctica from there. So they really... and. Um, can't remember if I said this on the podcast already at the beginning over there. That was when I was talking to you. But our actual entry into Oswaya really did feel like the end of the world. Um, we've been on these flat, very flat lands, um, kind of barren, brown, not very interesting sites for a long, long time. And then about 40 miles from the end, we uh, the mountains started to come. And suddenly we're, we're faced with these sheer rock cliffs. The snow was coming in, blizzarding in our face. The wind was so hard, we were pedaling as hard as we possibly could and barely moving. Mm. Um, and we, we sort of emerged into this city with the incredible skyline of the snowy mountains and the sea and this little city. And uh, we were incredibly cold and just like, we can't believe this is like getting towards the end. And, uh, yeah, incredible place, really the world's end. Well, you told us what it felt like to start. What did it feel like to finish? Uh, 
just just surreal. But like I say, we, we sort of entered into the city um, and I think we, we had a couple of pastries and we're just like, right, there's about 10 miles to go. <laughs> um, and we were like, oh, it'll take us, you know, take us an hour, just a little doddle down the road the last 10 miles. And then uh, the road disappeared again. We went onto like a gravelly path and it was wet and slushy and our bikes were all over the place. <laughs> and we're like, oh no, we thought we'd done it and we've got this last little bit of hell to go. Um, just crawling through along this path. Um, yeah, and we were just, yeah, we just went for it and go as fast as we can down this little path. Um, and the sun came out right at the end. Um, and we just, we saw the sign, the sign that just says Fan del Mundo, end of the world. Um, and it's got a little sign saying how far Alaska was away. It said it was like 12,000 kilometers or something, which is just not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get out a map and measure it, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we just saw this sign, put our bags down, and you know, just a really surreal feeling. I think you sort of you imagine the whole way when you, you're battling the winds and the mountains. You're just thinking like, although you, you can pretend you're not thinking about the end, but every every sportsman's thinking about the final. Every every tennis player's thinking about the Grand Slam final or that last match point. It's always in the back of the mind. We were just thinking about us wire those last few miles, um, and then yeah, you're thinking, am I going to burst into tears and? call my mom and just start crying or something or are we just <laughs> gonna like take our clothes off and just run around screaming i don't know <laughs> uh, and then then you get there and we, we got to the end and just sort of looked at each other and just like yes <laughs> yes <laughs> we've done it so we just uh i don't know just had a beer and sat down and just thought i don't know that's incredible i'm really sad it's over but also my bum is incredibly sore at this moment in time so <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be nice to have a day of just uh, sitting in a comfy seat and just have a lie down <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow what an amazing feat well i have to say congratulations and you know i i think some people attempt stuff like this for the glory and some people just find that the journey itself is is worth doing it doesn't matter you mm-hmm. know what matters is that you've had a life experience that very few people have ever experienced. And because of that, you have a story to share. And thank you very much for sharing it with us. I have to ask, though, if money were no object, some rich uncle, right, just threw a pile of money your way and said, go have another adventure, what would it be? Um, I think I'd just look for the, I'd go for the most remote place possible and just take, just me, just the backpack and just, just walk. I don't know, just, <laughs> just go completely wild and just exactly what you just said. Just try and have an experience that no one else could have. I don't know if it'd be like Eastern Russia or something or some somewhere where no no one else goes. And um, yeah, I just I just keep walking, walking until someone made me stop. <laughs> I think that would be my my ideal. Um, yeah, just just trying to search for that perfect that perfect place where you get just get back into the moment of all I'm doing is walking. No worries, no problems. Just just me and the wilderness, the adventure, just just the wildlife, just the walking, just the exercise, uh, just the fresh air, and that would be perfect for me. Mm, sounds wonderful. So if people want to learn more about what you guys did here, do you and uh, Chris have some sort of a blog or a website or a place that people can see pictures or, or learn more about it? Yeah, we've got, um, if you go to Cycle the Americas, all one word, Cycle the Americas on Facebook. Um, we have a page with loads of the pictures of the adventure and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that's got that's got everything that we can possibly. I mean, we weren't the best photographers. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> we tried to blog and keep everyone updated along the way. But um, yeah, if you'd like to find out more more about our adventure, that would be amazing. Um, we also raised uh, about seven and a half thousand pounds for uh, a brain injury charity in the UK called Headway, um, and I believe we're still raising money for those. Um, so if you just type in Danny Chris Cycling Americas, um, you'd be able to find that. Um, if you're interested in donating or anything. Um, but yeah, I think the, the actual website is it was www.cycleamericas.co.uk. And that, that'll just have a bit of information about us and about the, the project and the university and things like that. Yeah, we we sort of had, the website was basically just a, a place where people could go to track us along the way. We had like a live tracking system and um, a lot of yeah kind of followers on the way. So that was kind of mostly what we used the website for. But I'd say the Facebook page was the best place to find find any pictures or more information about the adventure. Oh, that's great. Well, your story has been very inspirational to me, and it sounds wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. And tell Chris, congratulations from the Adventure Sports Podcast, that what you guys pulled off is is amazing. Really, really oh, cool. So will you close us out here with uh, an inspirational story or just what inspires you to do things like this? 
it was just that that need for that need for adventure um and that's that's simply it like yeah for me it's pretty simple it's just it's just escaping society escaping the norms of everyday life just i mean being a medical student like i do i do enjoy it and i do want to be a doctor it's just i feel like i just want to go a bit slower and escape the everyday life and the simple day-to-day routines of jobs and i really feel like you need to take your opportunities and you need to go on an adventure I'm kind of I'm just inspired to to see what my what my body can do physically the places that i can go the hills that i can climb yeah i wouldn't say it was a particularly person that inspired me or anything but um just stories about the antarctic explorers what they can the physical insurance endurance that they can they can like do mark beaumont cycling across africa and things like this how on earth can a person physically achieve that i think yeah part of this was just a will that we wanted to see what our bodies could physically do if we pushed ourselves day after day after day if it's kind of the livestonian you know just the british thing of guys just wanting to explore push push themselves through a horrible experience in africa or whether it's the man just tried to cross the antarctica just a few a few months ago i don't know if you heard about this guy he unfortunately died just 30 miles short of uh, completing an, a solo Antarctic crossing, which is just the most incredible thing I could possibly think of anyone doing, just to do take all it was like a hundred days food, walking a silly amount of miles every day, mm. um, and just these sorts of physical endurance things that kind of just inspire me to push my body as hard as I possibly could. Even if me and Chris maybe we're not we're not athletes or anything, and a lot of this was just about just two guys being on a silly adventure, but um, it's. It was incredible to push our bodies to the to the maximum. Yeah, you never really know what you're capable of until you go try. And I think there are a lot of people that have never tried who think, wow, really? I don't know about that. But I would say to those people, maybe start a little bit smaller than the Pan American Highway, but go out and try something. You might be amazed what you're capable of pulling off. Yeah, and the feeling to have, to realize that you can actually do it is, is pretty unique. And yeah, you know, me and Chris will probably never stop never stop talking about this adventure and <laughs> Of a lot of a lot of memories that'll just be, you know, we'll have we'll have forever, and people will still want to hear our story in the pub when we're like seventy five and you know only got one leg or something. I don't know. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that's the best thing that comes out of these adventures is a, is just a treasure chest full of memories, and those are more valuable than than any material possession that you could have. So congratulations again, Danny, to you and to Chris, and thank you very much for being on the Adventure Sports Podcast. Thanks for having us. It's been great talking to you. Oh, you bet. And to all of our listeners out there, as always, get out there and have some fun. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to the show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast link is in the show notes and also if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure so if you know someone please reach out email us at info at adventure sports and until then get out there and have some fun <laughs>